And now, John Stossel. I tried to get the permits to open a legal lemonade stand outside the studio, but it was almost impossible. Fortunately, when kids sell lemonades, authorities usually ignore their excessive laws and let them do it. Usually, and that's a good thing, says Michael Holthouse. He's an entrepreneur who made big bucks when he sold a computer company. He started to sprint. And then your 10-year-old daughter asked you for a turtle. And what happened? Well, Alyssa wanted a turtle. She had too many pets, so of course I said no. The next morning, she gets this great idea to start a lemonade stand. Because she wanted the money to buy her own turtle. She had a goal. Exactly right. And so this is kind of how America works. If you want something, start a company, create it. It was the most unbelievable day we had together. And, and it really Why? got... Because I saw the light bulbs go off in Lissa's head. For the first time, she really understood how free enterprise worked and how business worked and, and how money worked. And it exposed her to, to what America is all about. And it occurred to me what an incredible opportunity for us to do this all across the country to jumpstart businesses again by getting to the future of our country, our kids. So you start in Houston, you say, let's have Lemonade Day. Yeah. And first time you got 2,000 stands. We did. Now you're in your sixth year and you have 200,000 stands around the country. Yeah, and maybe even more. And so our goal is to get, by next year, to a million stands in 100 U.S. cities where we believe ultimately every child in America should do a lemonade stand. But there's some cities where you won't even try, San Francisco, for example. There's an awful lot of laws in our country, and those laws have unintended consequences. And although the health department is designed to help protect us from bad food and bad vendors, it, it also is preventing us from teaching the youth of America uh, what we have been doing for hundreds of years in the United States and doing lemonade stands. So most places they say, okay, it's just a bunch of kids, lemonade, lemonade day, and we'll allow it. But some cities say, no, it wouldn't be safe. We have this rule, that rule. They won't even budge. Here, here's the good news. When the health departments or the police, as their representatives, have gone out and arrested these kids, in almost every case, it's turned into public outrage where they're saying you've missed the point and you need to back down and the health department needs to become supportive. So when you do this lemonade day, you don't just say, hey, kids, go sell lemonade. You have adults teach the kids how to run a business. He teaches them what he calls the four P's. We're basically running the business side, uh, using the four P's, which is price, product, place, and profit. You need to figure out what you're going to be selling and how much you're going to be selling it for. You've got these uh, 14 steps to success, setting goals, planning, finding an investor. You make them get an investor. What, what Lemonade Day is all about is, in a fun and experiential way, teaching youth every step in the process so they of have starting to borrow business. money to start their little lemonade stand? What a great way to teach them early. I mean, they give their elevator speech, they negotiate their an interest elevator rate. speech, meaning it has to be quick enough that someone in an elevator could hear it. Right. Why should you invest in our business? And one of the things he teaches kids is that it's important to make your lemonade business visible. And little cute things like this guy. He is an important part of our advertising. What's important is that it attracts attention. By making music, bright flashy colors. We're doing a flower booth. Things that people can see from far away. What are you going to put on your stand? Balloons. It was very cute. I guess most of them don't have goats by the stand. <laughs> but And I would think most health departments would frown on that. But good, good for that child to do that. Now, no as I said earlier, if the kids tried obeying all the rules you're supposed to obey, to open even a little business, they would never open lemonade stands. There are now 160,000 pages of rules. We have them here just from the feds. I mean, people have to spend lots of money trying to understand and obey all these rules. That's money that could have gone into hiring some productive people. It costs Americans $46 billion a year to follow just the new regulations that the Obama administration imposed. That's $46 billion a year that could have gone to job creation. Allison Fraser of the Heritage Foundation helped come up with those numbers. Uh, Allison? 
I think of Bush as the big regulator. People say, oh, he was a deregulator, but in fact, he hired thousands of new regulators. But what Obama has done is much more. That's absolutely right. Um, President Bush, when he was in office, had 28 major new rules passed uh, under his administration in the first more. three years alone. They don't look at this and say, maybe we have enough. They That's always right. feel it's their job to add. It's the great fallacy that Bush was a big deregulator. 28 major new rules. Obama is four times greater than that. And the cost for President Bush's uh, rules for the first three years of his administration were $8 billion. So we've had a virtual explosion, almost a regulatory assault on our system of free enterprise and on our job creators. Department of Transportation, new standards for airbags, window design, so if you get thrown out of a car, right. somehow you will be safe. Department of Energy, uh, extra costs for appliances. Mm -hmm. and. I mean, these have unintended consequences. The extra cost may deter you from buying a new one. You use the old appliance longer, which uses more energy. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, there's extra costs from each one of these that are passed along to the consumers. What a novel thought. And consumers are going to make a decision as to whether it works for them to replace their refrigerator or their freezer or their central, uh, central air conditioner and heating. And they may use longer these less efficient uh, uh, types of appliances. But these regulators aren't evil, they're not, and I assume they're not stupid, at least most of them. They want to do good. They think they're doing good. Well, I think that many of these things are very well-intended kinds uh, of initiatives. I don't know that I agree that all of them are. Um, but this is one of the problems when you have big government trying to take care of absolutely every perceived fault or risk that could happen in any individual's lives. There are many unintended consequences, and what we're dealing with right now that's really front and center in our economy is that we can't create jobs. That's because our economy is being assaulted by these new regulations. Michael, could you build Paranet today? That's the company he sold to Sprint for lots of money. It, it would certainly be harder, and it would take more. See, what happens with government regulation, it disproportionately affects small businesses because they don't have the resources to be able to deal with all of it. The big guys can say, I got a whole department, a compliance department, I hate the word compliance department, <laughs> that, that say, we can handle all this and it'll actually help us against the little guy because he'll struggle. But when you look at where all the jobs are created in America, it is not in the big companies, it's in all of the small companies. And, and according to the Kauffman Foundation, which is the, the, the big organization, uh, 501c, around entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. new companies are going down. The number of new starts is falling. And this is not good news for us over the long haul. So what do you tell the kids about this? I can't believe the kids are dealing with compliance issues. Well... Uh, at this point, you first teach them how do you start a business, and, and then you introduce the really rough, like, regulations and taxes and all the rest of them. But let's have them su have some success first. And it keeps growing, and they are having success, and they come out of this excited about business. I bet some of them say, I don't want to do this. This is a grind. Well, of course. Not everyone is going to love it. But so many of them do. Even if you want to be an artist, you're an entrepreneur because you create a product, you turn around and sell it. And this is all about how do we teach the youth of America to achieve the American dream and what's their role in that. Well, I'm glad you achieved it. You moved your company from one employee to 1,400 employees. If these rules make that harder, that's an awful thing for America. It slows down the process in a very big way. I thought we were supposed to be the land of opportunity. And we were. You <laughs> used past tense. <laughs> we, we still are. Uh, it's just getting harder every year. See, the regulators, as you pointed out, are great at making laws, but how many every year do they take off the books when we find that they're no longer important? None. One. Two. The regulators don't get it. Thank you, <laughs> Allison Fraser and Michael Holdhouse. Coming up on tonight's show, oysters, global warming, cigars, and marijuana.